Good evening, everyone. I mean, uh, it's a pleasant uh, evening, and uh, uh, I'm really very happy to be uh, interacting with the surgeons in this forum. Uh, basically, uh, I'm a anesthetist. Anesthetist talking in a surgical forum is something uh, uh, very rare uh, honor given to any anesthetist. I've done this few times. Uh, probably uh, uh, this is one of my favorite topic. Other favorite topic is if Disney ran your hospital, 10 things they will do differently. That's another interesting topic, actually. Uh, so I've spoken about that topic in a few surgeons for a while. So I'm, I'm basically an anesthetist and critical care physician. Uh, uh, myself, uh, along with my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Shalitma, started this hospital, Kaveri Hospital, in 1999 in. Um, in a small town uh, called Trichy in uh, Tamil Nadu. It's a tier three town at that point of time. Now it has become tier two town because of the growth actually. So uh, after uh, freshly graduating from uh, uh, medical college, uh, MBBS and MD from NSCC and uh, year of critical care training, I just came there. We just started the hospital with zero knowledge. Actually. We didn't know anything. Unfortunately, our medical school failed to teach us anything uh, about administration. Uh, the with uh, six months of uh, private practice after that, I started uh, uh, this hospital. And uh, uh, we learned everything. Uh, I mean, I, I keep telling that uh, we didn't know swimming. Someone threw me in the sea and I learned swimming in a very hard way. That's how we have learned, actually. And uh, my passion uh, is to travel, attend meetings, and attend uh, uh, many um, uh, yeah, our industry forums as well as other industry forums. In fact, I've learned a lot from other industry forums, and uh, this lean management is one of the things which we learned from other industries. So now I would like to do that. go to the presentation. First, I'd like to sa salute all the COVID warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an amazing year, I would say, that a very challenging year. But mm -hmm. uh, now, when uh, once we look uh, back into the last uh, 11 months, it has been a year uh, when uh, the healthcare community uh, across the globe has done tremendous work. And I think uh, they deserve all the glory which uh, I mean, was uh, denied by them, actually. So there was an immense opportunity to bring back the glory which we actually deserve, actually. Uh, for a very long time, at least uh, in uh, places like India, we didn't uh, get the kind of glory or recognition which we actually deserve. There was a huge opportunity. But uh, did we use that opportunity? Probably I can say that uh, partially we used and uh, partially we didn't use actually. So most of them, I mean, almost 90% of the doctors were in the front line, taking care of the patients and uh, doing amazing job, amazing job. Uh, and uh, not only uh, doctors, nurses and other uh, paramedics did a great job. But there were one or two occasions where we always, uh, I mean, of course, doctors were always targeted by media and the other people. We were targeted for the cost involved, actually. They said that, no, it's very costly treatment. Uh, COVID is very expensive. Of course, they don't look into the cost of setting up a government hospital and running it. But in private setup, people were complaining that, okay, the care was good. They were doing a good job, but it was costly. I couldn't afford it. So this particular topic will cover uh, partly how we are going to control the cost, actually. And of course, this COVID gave us another opportunity where the health-seeking behavior is going to change dramatically, actually. A lot of patients, public, are going to uh, seek uh, health care earlier, which they thought that they could uh, do it by getting a drug from the pharmacy. But now they're going to visit the hospitals and then uh, seek for a good uh, healthcare from a good institution. So now it becomes a bigger responsibility for us to keep up the expectations and deliver the care which they deserve and they seek, actually. So coming to the cost, actually. Cost is an important factor, but we were never uh, looking into the cost in our practice. And uh, people think that, okay, uh, if you want a healthcare, a good healthcare, of course you have to pay. But that's true. But uh, that doesn't mean that it can be uh, very costly or unrealistic prices could be there. But to put in that perspective, 
we should ask few questions. In fact, I've sent few questions earlier as a teacher. <clears throat> but I want to know how many people, man, most of the doctors, I, I feel the doctors are great entrepreneurs. Most of the people who come out of medical college aspire to start their own hospital. The hospital could be small, a clinic, OP clinic, or a small nursing home, or a big hospital. They invest in a hospital, they invest with their friends, start a big hospital, whatever it is. But do you know how much it will cost to build a hundred better hospital in a city like Chennai? That's very important because we need to see how much of investment is going in and what is the return on investment. So basically, the banks are very happy to fund doctors because we always repay the loans properly. You know, many industrials don't repay the loans and of course run out of the country, but we don't do it. We are responsible citizens. We pay back the loan, actually. To pay back the loan or equity, whatever is invested, we should know what is called return on investment. Before understanding return on investment, we should know what is the cost of building a hospital. For example, a tertiary care hospital. If you want to build a tertiary care hospital, 100 bedded hospital in a tier one town like Chennai or Bangalore or Delhi. I don't know about other cities. I know we have done hospitals in Chennai and Bangalore. It will cost somewhere around 50 lakhs to one crore, depending upon the kind of hospital you are building, facility you are creating. 50 lakhs means that a 100 bedded hospital will cost minimum 50 crores. That doesn't include land and building cost. Do we know that? So we have to really analyze all these things. Do we know that if you're a doctor, entrepreneur, a surgeon, especially most of the hospitals are owned by surgeons and gynecologists. And do you know that how much of money you have invested on in our operation theater? Building the operation theater, infrastructure, the air conditioning, all the laminar flow theaters, everything, and the equipments which you have invested, a lot of high-end equipments which we invest. Actually, people will not believe that in a nursing home, in a hospital, in a small secondary care hospital, 30% of the cost goes into the operation theater. Even if someone is building a 20-bedded or 25-bedded hospital, suppose there is a, a husband and wife doctors, a surgeon or a gynecologist or someone, building a hospital, they build a beautiful theater. And in fact, they don't invest so much of money in building their home. They build the operation theater, but they don't know exactly how much they have invested. Actually, they invest close to 30 to 40% of their cost will go into the operation theater. Do you know what is the average margins in various services? Various services means, I mean that surgical services, Diagnostic services could be lab and radiology, laboratory, how much is the margins or what are the margins which uh, inpatient services make or rehabilitation physiotherapy makes. Do you know, actually, we don't look into the costing. Actually. Do you know what is the return on investment? It's something which is not a corporate thing which I'm talking. Even if it is a small hospital, we have to look into the return on investment, actually. We can't be just pumping your money and then not getting the returns, but in turn charging more to the patients. That's not the appropriate way. We don't do that. Most of the doctors spend a lot of money. At, say they earn money, they save money. At the age of 40, 45, they get a land. They build, start building their hospital. They invest money in the infrastructure, equipments, running costs and other things. At the age of 50, they feel that, hey, look, I've invested so much of money. But what am I getting, actually? They actually don't know what is the return on margin, investment. Do you know what everyone thinks that, yes, pharmacy makes a lot of profit. Do you know exactly what is the percentage of margin your pharmacy is making? We don't know. We think that I got this injection for 30 rupees and I'm selling it as 60 rupees. So I'm making 100% profit. Sorry, that's not the uh, correct margin. You have to calculate the space of the pharmacy. You have to calculate the number of staffs uh, sitting there. And you also, you have to know what is the stock level in your pharmacy. How many of you know what is the stock level in your pharmacy? 
there is a simple thumb rule like suppose you have 2 lakhs turnover per month in your pharmacy what is a stock level that is 30 day stock level is 2 lakhs a, a good well run hospital will have only 20 day stock actually that means that 2 lakhs if you drill down to 20 lakh days it is come somewhere can somewhere around 1 lakh 50000 rupees is what stock level suppose you have 30 lakhs of sales per month a 20 day stock is 20 lakhs is what the stock level how many of you have seen that we don't see that we always focus on the delivery of care we see what the patient is getting but we don't see all these things so i'm just coming to that in the future slides in the coming slides i'll handle this it's a very interesting thing everything they fail to teach you in medical college i've been as dr ilangu said i've been running a exhibition called medical it's india's largest medical equipment exhibition last 15 years i've been running in chennai mumbai delhi and hyderabad i conduct seminars various seminars right from the day one first uh, exhibition the theme of the seminar is everything they fail to teach you in medical college when in that seminars we don't talk about clinical medicine clinical lectures will not be there purely management uh, uh, this thing but why these medical colleges fail to teach us about financial matters how to identify cost structures why they failed because medical colleges earlier those days medicine was considered as a noble profession charity only government hospitals were there or mission hospitals were there there was no private hospitals but in the last 20 30 years at least in india where which i know very well there are a lot of private healthcare institutions have come when private healthcare institutions come we are investing money we need to ensure that there is appropriate return on investment we can't be charging patients exorbitantly just to pay back our banks the government hospital don't pay back anyone so they don't charge but we get loan from the banks we have to pay back to the banks but we can't be charging exorbitantly we need to know the cost our costing has to be right and the investment has to be right return on investment has to be appropriate and the profit margins have to be decent i'm not telling profit is a decent word profiteering is bad but profit is a decent word we are running a institution we have to make a decent profit to invest in our own institution or pay back the banks so the medical colleges even today have failed to teach us how to manage our practice for example my close friend and a roommate who went to us did his residency at the last uh, year of his residency he had a fantastic series of lectures on practice management tell me how many of your surgical colleagues or how many of us had that kind of a training program we never had that kind of a training program that's really unfortunate suddenly we are thrown into the uh, uh, public space we learn by making mistakes should we continue to learn from making mistakes no we should learn from others mistake and also medical colleges should teach us how to practice so we are going to see how to improve the profitability of our hospital don't think that i'm talking commercial pro i said said profit is not the bad word profiteering is a bad word people think that how do you increase the profit imagine there is a discussion among your uh, colleagues or managers we say that how do we increase the profit someone says that sir we are charging 1500 for ct scan the other hospital charge 2000 rupees if we increase to another 500 rupees we will make profit then you may will say oh good they will increase to 2000 we find that we don't make that kind of a profit but actually we don't understand that we can make a good profit by cutting down the cost increasing price is one option which we may not get in the coming years as i said in my earlier slide the health seeking behavior will increase will improve dramatically but most of the health seekers will go for insurance insurance so far at least a few years back they were paying what we are charging but nowadays insurance companies have been really rigid i don't think they are going to pay what we are going to charge they have very rigid about tariffs so 
cutting down cost is the best option. I'll tell a simple example. 12 years back, our state got uh, the government insurance scheme. Tamil Nadu got a government insurance scheme. So we saw the tariffs in government insurance scheme. It was 40%, 30 to 40% less than our standard tariff. For example, if a TURP cost somewhere around 50,000 rupees, it was the government uh, rate was only 30 to 35,000 rupees. So how do you operate on a 30% reduction in cost? Actually, we started exploring various options. That's when we deep dived into our data. We found out that for an average TURP patient, what is the cost? What is the hospital bill? What is the doctor's fees? What is the consumable cost? What is the pharmacy cost? What is the laboratory or investigation cost? We found out that there are many ways which we can cut down cost. Actually. The consumables, the investigations, so many things and the length of stay, average length of stay. How many of us know that what is the, our average length of stay in our hospitals? That's a very critical parameter which will determine our profitability and operational efficiency. So how do you cut down all these things? And I can clearly say that 12 years back, we cut down a lot of unwanted expenses. And I'll tell you, suppose we made 20% profit in a regular cash patient. We made 15% profit in the government insurance patient after cutting down the cost. This is a practical example. I'm not talking something which I've read in book. Of course, I learned a lot from reading some good books, but I'm talking about what we have implemented in our hospital. So we have to understand that, as I told you, I'm very passionate about uh, traveling. I'm very passionate about attending various seminars, healthcare seminars, clinical seminars. But the last 15 years, I started attending a lot of seminars from other industries. Okay. So I feel that we should all, as doctors and entrepreneurs, we should all learn from other industries. Because a lot of good practices are there in other industries. For example, I went to a car manufacturing plant way back, actually. That's when the car manufacturing started in England. You should see that amazing workflow. It is a fantastic workflow. Everything is predetermined. Something concept called just-in-time. So many things have been predetermined. The cost has been cut down significantly. And a few years back, I visited my friend, Garment Industry. You know, Garment Industry has been facing severe challenges. Earlier, India was the export hub of the world, actually. We have been exporting a lot of garments. But suddenly, Bangladesh and Vietnam started competing with us. They started producing the same goods at least 30 to 40 percent cheaper than us. So there was a severe uh, hit for the garment industry. They started adopting lean practices. And you will know, I was talking to my friend, you know, money, uh, we adopted the lean practices in my garment factory. Uh, you know, I reduced uh, uh, 10 rupees cost uh, per shirt, which I manufactured. I said, come on, 10 rupees you reduced. I said, what is the uh, cost you sell it to the supplier? or dealer or the retailer. He said, I sell it to them at 350 rupees. Of course, they sell it for 700 to 7,000 rupees. I sell it to them 350 rupees. I said, 350 rupees, 10 rupees you saved. How do you think that that is going to add to your bottom line? Is that money? Earlier, I was get, just getting seven rupees profit per shirt. Of course, I manufacture around 50,000 shirts in a day. Seven rupees in the 50,000 is three and a half lakhs. Today, I saved another 10 rupees. You mean to say that five lakhs per day is saved, actually. So the profit margin is so thin for them. So they cut down cost by another 10 rupees. That is very, very less when compared to 350 rupees of manufacturing cost. And so we need to learn from other industries. I always keep telling my colleagues, doctors, colleagues that, you learn hospitality from a hotel or airlines. You learn lean management from manufacturing industry. You learn automation from the IT industry. 
that's and of course those industries should learn empathy from us of course we are very very empathetic they, do, they are not empathetic actually so they should learn empathy from us they should learn commitment from us okay we are frontline warriors no government companies can become frontline warriors so we need to learn best practices from them so that's what we are going to say in that. so lean practices started in japan post world war 2 Post World War II, Japan was a very proud country. I visited Japan a few times. Japan, Japanese people are very proud people. They are very, very hardworking people. And in, that's why World War II, they became very aggressive. They started occupying a lot of countries. But fortunately or unfortunately, they had a very big defeat they, because of the nuclear bomb. Their industries are gone, absolutely shattered. and since they are very proud people they said that we are going to revive this they started reviving the industry they become they didn't have the adequate capital the very limited capital they started manufacturing practices manufacturing industries then they realized how i can reduce cost and that's how lean practices started so toyota was one of the leaders in lean practices there is something called toyota production system in fact this lecture i will not cover everything i'll just stimulate your interest in this probably you can go everything is online i learned online i didn't have any formal training in this you just go to and see the tps toyota production system is there everywhere toyota you know started manufacturing cars because of their lean practices very frugal nature they manufactured the car at 50% of the cost of what american car manufacturing manufacturers did america was the leading producer for cars so what toyota did toyota started exporting to america within 5 years the entire america american car industry collapsed because they couldn't compete my favorite and best car was a honda honda was such a fantastic car was so cost effective fuel efficient very very uh, robust car actually so similarly all the american car manufacturer let it be uh, ford or chrysler everyone collapsed then these guys saw what these guys how these guys are able to give the cars for such a low cost they went to japan they saw the toyota production system they documented lean management practices they implemented they propagated in fact americans propagated lean management japanese are very uh, conservative people they don't talk because their english is very bad so americans propagated the lean principles across the world actually so that's what called toyota production system so a important thing is called value stream mapping in a lean management we call value stream mapping before that i'll say that what is the quality time with your family as a surgeon as a doctor our families are always upset that we are not spending quality time with our family we say that no no i am spending quality time you mean to say Oh, okay. What is the quality time? Then we say that say, look, I came back from the hospital at six o'clock, and then I'm spending in the family. Come on, boss. You came back from the family from the hospital at six o'clock, but eight o'clock you log into the system and start listening to this lecture. Do you mean that this is quality time? No. Either you watch Netflix or you see your WhatsApp. You talk to the uh, fellow surgeons. You read books. You don't spend quality time. So what do you mean by quality time? Quality time is you sit. with your wife a spouse or children and chat hey what happened today so how are you today talk to the children that what happened in your class so what have we learned today have a dinner together that's what quality time with the family similarly value stream mapping shows that why do a patient come to the hospital patient comes to the hospital to see a doctor talk to him about his disease and also get treatment it could be a prescription investigation or a surgery but imagine a patient coming to a hospital so the value is consulting a doctor getting the medicine getting the investigation done consulting a doctor takes 5 10 minutes max getting a prescription waiting time is high the actual prescription delivery is 5 minutes investigation the pre takes 5 minutes the result take 5 minutes but this 30 minutes or this 30 minutes patient comes to the hospital 10 o'clock in the morning 
waits for the hospital doctor to see average waiting time is 1 hour in the opd then doctors gives a lab investigation he goes to the lab he waits for a half an hour to take his blood after that he waits for another 6 hours to get his lab reports then once again comes to the doctor waits for 1 hour then the prescription is given the goes to the pharmacy waits for half an hour gets a prescription done but ultimately for a 30 minutes of value added services he spends at least 6 hours in the hospital so he doesn't he pays for the consultation fees or a lab investigation or for the pharmacy but for that he has to spend eight hours if you see at today's average earning for a person is summer suppose someone is uh, earning a good amount of money his average earning per day is five thousand rupees so he has wasted that five thousand rupees without any value Suppose all these things happen within the one hour, he can take a permission from his office, finish up everything and go. That's what we are going to see. What are the value we are adding? So the, the value added services, consultation, surgery, or lab, and but the patient spends for other non-value added items like waiting time. Waiting time is the most horrible non-value adding activity in any healthcare setup. Do you know how much time they spend in the waiting room? We don't analyze that. So that's what I'm going to look into now. So Lean and Six Sigma are something like Hub Brothers. Lean is defined as a set of management practice to improve efficiency and effectiveness by eliminating waste, actually. Okay. It is to eliminate non-core value-adding activities. As I said, waiting time is a non-core value-adding activity. Six Sigma is a tool which improves the business process and reduces the errors, improves the profit. It's basically to reduce errors. The surgical safety checklist reduces the errors, but lean management reduces the waste cost to the patient. So what are the components of lean and how do you apply lean in practice? The strategy of lean is to use continuous improvement, continuous CQI in NABH, where they say continuous quality improvement, continuous Improvement is something which is required. Something which we did 10 years back doesn't hold good today. So we have to improve daily. The continuous improvement eliminates waste from care process and leaves only value added activity. There are seven com common forms of this which I'll address. And there is something called 5S. It is something a Japanese principle once again. Sorting, simplifying, sweep, standardize and sustain. There are a lot of visual controls as part of 5S which I'm not going to address today but all of you can go into the net and find out that. And then just-in-time processing, it's something which they practiced in car manufacturing industry. And also level-loaded work, the staff cannot be overloaded or underloaded. We have to have a level-loaded work and we have to build in quality as a culture to achieve highest quality of patient care. If you see our seven components of waste, Excessive motion, waiting time, overproduction, unnecessary processing time, defects, excessive resources, unnecessary ineffective handoffs. These are seven components of waste which is applicable to any industry, relevant to the medical industry. I'm just going to say excessive motion. So, incorrect floor layout. Suppose your consultation room is in second floor, your lab is in first floor, your radiology is in ground floor. Your pharmacy is outside. Imagine, so the patient has to move all these floors. If he is in a wheelchair or something, a old patient, he will use all the lift, electricity, and everything. And suppose the pay, the surgical floor theater is there in the sixth floor in one block, and the surgical ward is there another block in the third floor. Imagine the transport of patients. Half an hour it takes minimum, half an hour to two hours. So. It is excessive motion. That's a waste. As I said, waiting time for surgery or delayed surgery or waiting time for investigation waste actually. Overproduction is something which a lot of, say for example, suddenly they order materials. I say that, okay, ethylon. Suddenly they're given excess of ethylon. More, say for example, normally in a theater we use 10 boxes in a month. Suddenly they give 20 boxes. Imagine that is a waste actually. And unnecessary processing time. Basically, there are multiple steps. If you analyze, there are multiple steps of the craft 
which is delaying the CAD actually. And defects, of course, various defects are there. Suppose there is a surgical site infection, patient is getting delayed discharge, cost is there, that is a waste actually. Of course, that is very important. Of course, the excessive resources, we have five operation theaters, but we do only two theater surgeries in a theater. That is a waste of resources. And of course, unnecessary, ineffective handoffs. If you have practicing NABH or JCA, you know that handover takeover is an important parameter. That's very important. But there are too many handovers and takeovers and errors happen. These are seven components of waste. You analyze internally and see how it can be reduced. Have you ever analyzed surgical services? What is the return on investment? I've invested so much of money in the building the theater, infrastructure, air handling unit, AC, laminar flow, the HIPAA filter, and also I have a lot of 3D microscope, 3D, uh, what do you say, laparoscopic equipment, high-end uh, surgical cautery, and a very high-end uh, operation theater table, and also uh, 10 staffs exclusively for that. And all these surgical staffs are paid more because they are very highly skilled work, of course. Have you seen that? Please go back to your hospital and see that how much we are investing and how much revenue we have earned. If you are a owner, you see how much you are in. Or if you are practicing in a hospital, see that how much your owner is earning that. We have to calculate the OT utilization rate. This is the simplest and important uh, formula which we are seeing. We have five theaters and how many surgeries we do in a day? How many hours a theater is working? We say that average working hours should be eight hours. A theater should be used for eight hours of surgical time. Not that wheeling in, wheeling out. Eight hours of surgical time has to be there. You just go back to your theater, you go back to your theater nurse or manager, ask them the data. You'll find out that most of the hospitals are using less than four hours in a day. That's because there is a delay in start of the surgery. It could be the first time surgery. Morning, 8 o'clock, people like to start. But most of the time, the surgery starts at 9 o'clock. Or after something, you book the case at 10 o'clock, but the surgery started at 11 o'clock. Or what is the last surgery time? What is the number of times the surgery is rescheduled? You schedule a surgery at 10 o'clock, you postpone it to 2 o'clock, or you postpone it tomorrow or how many surgeries are cancelled. All these things are wastage in the resources. What are the common causes of these wastage? Suppose surgery delay, common causes transportation. Sir, I've called the ward boy, he is delaying it. So half an hour or one hour delay. Sir, we have asked for a HIV investigation, we are asked for last sugar value, but we haven't got it actually. Sir, this is patient is an insurance patient, but the, the approval is getting delayed. Sir, I've ordered for an implant, TKR implant from Johnson Johnson. That guy said that sir, some problem is coming only at 11 o'clock. I'm just highlighting three or four or five causes. But if you really look into it, there will be around 10 common causes of wastage in your hospital. It could vary from hospital to hospital. But mostly these are the causes. You deep dive into it. You analyze it. You see the root cause analysis. Lean management always takes up a problem and goes deep into it and does a root cause analysis. There is a problem solving technique called five whys. You ask why, why the patient is delayed. They say that there is no ward boy. Why there is no ward boy? Because there is no inadequate ward boy. Why there is no inadequate ward boy? Because there is no proper work correction. Like that you see five whys, you know the problem actually. So you do a root cause analysis, RCA, which is called in management terms, five eyes, and understand why these wastages are occurring. One of my surgeons, my orthopedic surgeon did a study. Actually, Manivanan, you talk about so many management principles. You know, we did a study. He sees that every time I start a surgery, I ask for some material, the floor uh, theater uh, assistant, opens the door, goes to the showroom, gets the material. He did a study. He said that on an average, 12 times they open the door, go out to get a material. 12 times, which is horrible. Many, many, many ways it's horrible. 12 times you are opening a door, the outside air comes in, it will cause infection. 
12 times you are opening a door, the AC flows out, the electricity bill goes up. And wastage of time. Surgeon asks, three zero ethanol, they run away. You just do this study in your hospital. You will understand. So after this study by the orthopedic surgeon, we started creating a checklist for surgery. Suppose it is a TKR. The materials required, the instrument required, we'll have a checklist. We take a printout, laminate it, and hang it inside the theater. If the surgeon sees or the theater nurse sees, then she will understand these are the materials that have to be kept inside before starting the surgery. So this reduces this. This is the wastage of movement once again. And of course, all of you know the WHO surgery checklist and uh, Atul Gavande uh, introduced this. Please see the, but read the book called Checklist Manifesto, amazing book. And I read that book. I Before reading the book, I read this article, started implementing it way back in 2007. It saved a lot of errors and all these redos actually. So even after doing this, do you think that there is 100% PlayStation of theater? It is not realistic. If it is 90%, excellent, you have done a great job. And if it is 80%, then you have done a, a really good job. Scheduling algorithm uh, is done and it is achievable. 80% is achievable. 70%, say suppose eight hours of average time, you do somewhere around seven hours, acceptable. 50% of you say, suppose eight hours is average, you work only for four hours. It implies poor management and theater capacity is also excessive. Instead of two theaters, you had four theaters. 30% less is unacceptable and that shows poor management. Okay, you can ask, Dr. Manimi, you are talking about car manufacturing. Look here, boss. I'm not manufacturing car. I'm not repairing a car. I'm treating patients. They are different. 100% acceptable. I also know that everyone knows that. So, what is the difference between manufacturing and healthcare? We have to see value creation, process type, technology, and competitive mechanism. Value creation, actually, it is very easy in manufacturing. Okay, there is hardly any customer interaction. They are not going to talk to any guy who is going to own the car, actually. The quality can be directly measured, whereas here it is very difficult. There is a production and consumption. You are operating and consuming. And customer is fully involved. You are operating on the customer. So the customer is not involved there. And the quality is actually perceived in our industry. It is not uh, actually delivered and difficult to measure. Process type, there is a mass production. There is hardly any variation. If they are manufacturing Maruti 800, they manufacture only Maruti 800. Do you think that that's possible? No, that's not possible because every product, every patient is different. Even if it is a diabetic patient coming for lab cooling, one guy is uncontrolled, another guy is a controlled guy. One guy with infection, another guy without infection. There's a lot of difference. Technology. Actually, there is a logical sequence happening in manufacturing, actually. That is called a shop floor or uh, assembly line. That is not possible. Actions are based on the capabilities and the feedback from the product. Suppose the patient behaves differently. He's showing rigor. He's showing infection. We have to change. And also, we know that in car manufacturing industry, we know the exact pricing, exact material cost, but it is not possible in healthcare. But still, a lot of hospitals in Western countries and Japan have implemented lean and done health excellent. We can't be doing a typical Toyota production system. A modified system can be implemented. So how lean is implemented normally? Actually? Normally, what happens in management, the leader gives an order, SOP is prepared, it is implemented by everyone. But here, lean is the frontline worker, the nurse, the OP building, the lab person says that, sir, there is a problem here. I can improve the efficiency by doing this, that, actually. So the frontline workers do a lot of innovation and managers trust them and support them. Actually, in a regular management thing, the frontline worker respect the manager or the managing director. But here, the managing director or the manager respect the frontline low-level worker. It is not just upward, actually. Okay. So, Lean has the potential to turn an organization into a community of investors, in innovators. Suppose you have 500 employees, at least 100 can become innovators and improve the process and 
but this will happen only if that culture is implemented in the organization so to take hold of the lean transformation basically we have to build in a culture of continuous improvement you can't say that someone a theater nurse says that doctor uh, can we do this immediately what we say come on am i a doctor or you are a doctor i have been doing this for the last 20 years who are you to tell me that is not right anyone can give improvement as a suggestions and there has to be a culture of continuous improvement and the senior management must relinquish the role of master problem solver doesn't mean that just because we are head of institution we are a manager we are a senior surgeon doesn't mean that we have solutions for all the problems the theater nurse or the ward boy there in the floor will have a better problem solving solution than what we have actually so whoever is closer to the problems will give the better solution and that will benefit from their knowledge actually so to conclude way back in 2008 i read this book lean management in lean hospitals by mark graben this book was not available someone uh, gave a lecture about lean management i went into google saw this book and luckily at the time flipkart was available i ordered this book came from us but unfortunately even today this book is not available in india but i will just circulate the soft copy to the organizers of this meeting he can circulate to everyone you can read it amazing book lot of things we can learn mark graben also has a blog called lean blog very interesting blog he gives lot of interesting case studies every week actually please read this and uh, my sincere thanks to dr ilangu and other people of this forum for giving me an opportunity i was always worried being an anesthetist how am i going to talk in front of such elite surgeons but i'm very happy that uh, when i've addressed these uh, you but i'll be really happy if at least few of you start implementing lean practices in your theater not only in your theater but in your organization because that's going to reduce the cost to the patient and that is going to impact the healthcare delivery in the long run in this country which is still a developing country thank you thank you everyone thank you dr ilango thank you mani sir um a wonderful lecture we have, i have always enjoyed your lecture and i wanted to share this uh, um share this learning experience uh, that i have had from you with the lgs team uh, i'll set the ball rolling by asking you a few questions which i have been uh, yeah. which i have been uh, planning for quite some time so um in when when we do liver transplants i mean uh, i have recognized that uh, we usually write a huge list of instruments a huge list of sutures preparing for every contingency so uh, a couple of days ago i was auditing all the uh, instruments in our hospital and then we found out that uh, there were six clamps instead of two for every type for every type okay. at, for for a cable clamp we had the two types of germans two two uh, clindmom clamps and the two angle clamps and a set of uh, uh, setting skis it was really too much now how does one uh, prepare the protocol to avoid over processing wastes and this is really a uh, key for surgeons you know how many how many instruments they have to buy and how do they prepare for contingency what's your experience and thought on this so being a hospital promoter uh, when surgeons like ilango and come uh, comes to me and asks uh, sir i want to start a liver transplant i need so many equipments i send it to purchase they say that sir it is costing 1 crore of rupees i said 1 crore for liver transplant equipment of course sir there are around 50 varieties of clamps actually okay so you are talking about a very complex surgery actually it's a complex process when you are doing a liver transplantation program naturally we have to invest into, into it we can't avoid it actually if there is a possibility of vendor managed inventory uh, vendor managed inventory is something called say where uh when I mean, all of you would have experienced it for a, a joint replacement surgery if you uh, tell the johnson johnson guy he will come and bring you the variety of sizes of implants whatever we use he will charge actually in orthopedic surgery they bring in the entire equipment set we use it and then the implants alone we charge it actually 
if there is a possibility of having a vendor managed inventory these high cost inventory can be cut down in the initial phases suppose you are a high volume center that you do multiple liver transplant of course you have to buy all these things but there is something where we can play a major role where suppose there are I, mean, i don't know about liver transplant surgery multiple liver transplant surgery is happening so but there are hospitals where we have five cardiologists or three cardiac surgeons or five orthopedic surgeons if you standardize their materials the five orthopedic surgeon doing a tk or doing a, a i mean a joint replacement not only or some fractures or implants everyone has got their own choices of implants it could be the company it could be the material titanium or stainless steel or everyone will have their own choices of suture materials if you sit and talk to all these surgeons standardize the material base there will be a dramatic reduction in the cost as also errors suppose you go inside the theater the nurse would have prepared for the list of surgeon a but actually surgeon b list is there and he she has to replace everything it takes time actually so if you have multiple surgeons with the same specialty you discuss with them you have a when when uh, having discussion will have fantastic results you discuss with them standardize the materials one is vendor managing inventory other is standardizing materials when you have multiple surgeons in the same specialty that's a great one is this the reason why uh, why we have checklists for uh, uh, particular procedures or uh, operating room packs in the western world yes so i mean checklist is something which is amazing which was brought by uh, atul gawande into clinical practice but checklist is not a recent phenomenon 25 30 years back you learn from airline industry in the airline industry 30 40 years back there was too many accidents in the airline industry suddenly what happened they started doing the root cause analysis they uh, delved into why the problem occurs so they created a checklist if you see that in any cockpit it's called a cockpit drill actually you see the cockpit checklist 1 2 3 4 after five checklists only they start the airplane itself so that checklist reduce the errors and improve the efficiency in airline industry so we copied it from the airline industry so this checklist were created so for every surgery a checklist is created on the medical checklist on the instrument checklist and also i've seen a surgeon some surgeons creating a beautiful layout suppose i'm doing a high end neurosurgery actually so the table is there he will do a beautiful drawing where the microscope has to be there on the right side or left side where the diaphragm has to be there he will put a clear drawing any uneducated theater boy will know that where to keep the microscope many times what happens without that the surgeon will say hey are how many times i have said the microscope has to be on the left side on the other foot end so this creates problem so checklist is a very good thing but unfortunately what happened wherever you go when i am an nabh assessor i have seen that all these checklists have become tick list actually they just tick it that's all but the checklist has to be followed in the, the entire spirit of the checklist if you do that 90% of all our problems will be solved that's what my uh, says beautiful thank you um are there any questions from the floor or uh, can i go on um, go 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 on can i go so um what would be the expiry time rules you know uh in one of the hospitals where i was working um we looked at some of the surgical sutures which has never been used like uh, uh one surgeon was very much interested in gortex sutures and uh, he bought a lot of them because he was very fond of using them in kidney transplantations and when he left the hospital uh, nobody was willing to use the gortex and ultimately i used it in the uh, surgical training lab they are very expensive sutures but ultimately i ended up using for uh, practicing knots so how how does uh, i mean we are a developing country we cannot afford to have that so how do you manage those uh, expiry time rules what what's your rule for that so that's what i was just telling about just in time just in time is a very important thing this happened in car manufacturing industry also if you see a car manufacturing plant let it be hyundai or toyota or whatever it is 
Chennai has got a lot of car manufacturing plant. If you go and see that, the Hyundai plant will be there. Surrounding that, suppose Hyundai plant is around 50 acres, they will buy another 50 acres and then they will just give the another 50 acres to all the component manufacturers. Okay. So component manufacturers will be there actually. Okay. So the Hyundai manufacturer will know that tomorrow I am going to manufacture this model of car around 20 cars. So the equipment list or the spare part list, component list will go to the respective vendor. So the previous day evening, the van from the man, uh, component manufacturer will come into the main car manufacturing plant. And the morning, the components will be organized. It will not be stored, stopped or expired actually. So we need to practice that just in time. Even if a surgeon asks, you can say that, okay, for a kidney transplant, this number of suture material is only required. So you buy only that. Or you can try that. Or you can say that I'll try this and then if it is not working, I have to give back. You have to have a return policy. It has to be returned. Or, I mean, this is something which I cannot say, but see, in a poor country like that, we can always do an ETU and reuse it, but that's not part of lean practice. Okay? Lean practice is preventing wastages, not to manage wastages. So, thank you. Thank you. And, um, one more question on gadget loving surgeons. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I was one of them, <laughs> but uh, over years I have learned to operate with much less. Um, so there was this uh, uh, young surgeon who loved to have two cautery, a hormonic scalpel, a ligature, and a bipolar cautery for a transplant surgery. And we used to have a uh, instrument called Aquamandis. I mean, he will have everything on the table. And uh, the, the head nurse of the operating room was really wild. But I could not say anything at that point of time because of my training position. So uh, I just kept quiet. And uh, I found out that most of the time, uh, these instruments were never used. In US, they were a single time use. So they were a huge wastage. And uh, sometimes I see the same thing happening in our country. Uh, though we, we may not have all the equipment, we find that uh, people love to have more and more equipment. And uh, some of them are never used. Like the cell savers in uh, transplantation, very infrequently used. But unless you actually uh, look at it, you will end up buying a cell saver because it looks cool. So how does the management handle that? Or how does a surgeon who runs a small practice handle such a gadget-loving surgeon? <laughs> I like the terminology gadget for surgeons. <laughs> so I will in turn ask you a question. Uh, I was just talking on return on investment. Okay. Suppose you invest in equipment, I say 10 lakh worth of equipment, and you charge certain amount of uh, money for that. And in uh, three years, you get the money back, including the interest cost on the principal capital, whatever it is. So which is the best equipment on return on investment in a hospital? I'm not talking about theater or something. Do you know which is the best equipment which gives the best return on investment? Suppose you put in a mutual fund, you know that in uh, four years or uh, five years, we get a uh, double the return. Some uh, investment makes immediately two years. Okay. Some investment makes it in six months also. So now Sensex being in 50,000, you know that some investment made a double the amount in for six months. So what is the best instrument like that? Is Can it you actually, just... <laughs> I think it's easy. You're like a, oh, you're like a, good. ECG machine is the best equipment with the return on investment. You buy it for 50,000 rupees. You take uh, 10 ECGs in a day and you charge 100 rupees. That is around 1,000 rupees. The consumable cost is very less. So within a matter of one and a half months, you get a return on investment. But when a physician goes and asks a management, I want additional ECG machine for what? They say, no, no, no. We don't adjust now. We invested a lot of money on the data. I can't give you. Okay. That is not appropriate investment we should make, actually. But we need to be very uh, prudent, actually. Say, so basically, certain equipments may not give return on investment, actually. But it is needed. For example, we did the same argument way back in 2001. When I was trained in anesthesia, 
I never used an anesthesia ventilator. I, I, I was, there was only one anesthesia ventilator in my 10 theaters in that college at the time. I know how to use an anesthesia ventilator, but that was not in work. So we were using the regular uh, ambu bag and other things and the manually we were doing it. When I came back and started my practice, I was feeling very bored. So I was just talking to my colleague, who is also my co-founder. I said that uh, he's also an anesthetist. I said, come on, Chandrakumar, we'll buy uh, anesthesia ventilator. You know what he said? You know what is the cost of anesthesia ventilator? I said it was a one lakh at that point of time. Okay, one lakh. Can you charge for that anesthesia ventilator to a patient? No, I can't charge. Imagine investing one lakh is waste. Okay. Rather, I'll give you a theater boy. At that time, uh, his salary was 4,000 rupees. For 20 months, you can have the theater boy. Okay. He said, <laughs> so that is the return on investment he was talking. At the same time, in 2004, when our surgeons, we were one of the very few hospitals in those days, we were doing replantation, re implantation surgery, microvascular surgeries. So the surgeon was asking, I need a Carl Z's microscope. And nothing less than that. You were arguing a lot of things. No, no, Carl Z's is costing. I said, I need a Carl Z's. Carl Z's was costing 30 lakhs at that point of time, which was a huge investment. But he convinced us and said, look, money, you will not get direct return from this. But if I do two surgeries and you put it in your paper, that is a branding cost you do. That you, for a tertiary care hospital, you need to have this equipment. Believe me, we got it for 30 lakhs. It worked. It was for 14 years, actually. And so many re-implantation surgeries were done. And we did a rough calculation of how much that uh, microscope would have directly earned. Probably wouldn't have earned more than 8 lakhs in the 14 years. Leave alone the interest and depreciation, so many things. But indirectly, it would have earned multiple millions of dollars for us. Actually. Similarly, currently, when we are talking about investing on a neurosurgery microscope, we were having a old microscope for the past 10 years. Of course, all these microscopes last for ages, 15 years, 20 years they come. So when our neurosurgeon said, look, the next microscope has to be the latest. We have been doing it for the 12 years. The next microscope has to be latest. I said, come on, the latest microscope cost 1.8 crores, actually. Our budget was only 80 lakhs. Our neurosurgeons convinced us and said, look, boss, we are a tertiary care hospital reputed hospital in this state and we are doing high-end surgeries last 10 years i have been doing all high-end surgeries because of the old microscope i am not able to go and present it my surgeries and the reputation is not spread outside but you have to invest if you invest in this next 10 years we are not going to ask for it so we invested believe me that microscope gave us a huge mileage and we are able to operate on very complex neurosurgeries and our neurosurgery department is very reputed in this part of the country. So we have to take a calculated decision. We have to discuss with the surgeon. The surgeon has to understand the management. The management has to understand the surgeon and we have to balance it rightly. Then only it will be a win-win situation. Not every equipment will give a ROI immediately. It is not then, the, then we'll be investing in a share market, not in a hospital. Um, I have a few more. Now, um, how do you uh, insist on the operating room start time? Uh, we, I, I currently work in a very disciplined hospital, but still I find there's a lag time of about an hour. Uh, in US, I found that uh, there is a chief nurse who stands outside the door. If the surgeon does not sign the uh, checklist at 7 a.m. in the morning, they're actually penalized. They are severely <laughs> penalized. I've seen that. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm sure we cannot do that in India. And how do you propose and how, how have you solved this problem as an anesthetist, and as a management person? So last 10 years, I'm not practicing anesthesia. So as an anesthetist, I don't know their pain now. But as a management person, I also know the pain actually. <laughs> so you are not alone. Everyone, every hospital has got this problem actually. Say in US, uh, they penalize. Uh, obviously, we can't do it. Actually, that's not the right. Say penalizing people will not be uh, the right way to build the right team, actually. See, basically, how we do is create a very friendly environment within the theater. 
See, what happens in theater, the anesthetist is on one side, the surgeons are on one side. Doesn't mean that all surgeons are one side. They have multiple groups, uh, neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon, or between two surgeons in the same specialty, there is a competition or a bitterness. Or right management talks to the surgeons, brings them to the same room, have a frank discussion with them and say that, look boss, my because of you, I have a shift actually. Morning 7.30, I asked four nurses to come. And because of you, they are staying there in the late hours. My nurses go home late at eight o'clock or nine o'clock. One is, of course, they also have family. They have to go back home. The second thing is I have to pay overtime to them. It is adding to the cost. And the third thing is, say that your next surgeon is troubled. Imagine someone starts a surgery, supposed to start at eight o'clock, starts at nine o'clock. That it has got a cascading effect on the entire list actually. So it is very difficult. We are talking about empathy for doctors. We have to be empathetic towards the patient. I feel that you have to be empathetic towards your colleagues, fellow surgeon. You have to be empathetic about your nurses. They are your core strength, actually. So this is how we have to talk to them, make them understand what kind of a trouble they are creating because of a simple delay, actually. And the administration also have to be supportive. They should say that, boss, you come here at 8 o'clock. The surgeon will say that, sir, I came here at 8 o'clock. But the anesthetist came later, or anesthetist also came at 8 o'clock. The induction, everything started positioning. And exactly it took me one and a half hours to put me the incision. So we have to create an ecosystem where the senior surgeon comes at 8 o'clock, but the junior surgeon comes at 7 o'clock, the anesthetist comes at 6.30, and does everything. And the junior surgeon does marking, positioning, everything. The senior surgeon comes at 8 o'clock and does the incision. So it is a collaborative effort, win-win situation, and that's the only way to find out a solution for this difficult problem. If you ask me whether I have found a solution, no, I am in the process of finding a solution. It is a journey, not a destination. <laughs> we also have Patal Krishna sir, who is uh, currently the head at SIMS, so I'm sure uh, he will have questions on uh, lean management as well. Uh, Patal, sir, yeah, uh, uh, very, very uh, sort of uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture, I should say, uh, and a, a lot of take-home points. Um, and of late, uh, Ilango, I should admit that we are also thinking in terms of uh, words like patient satisfaction and uh, uh, patient uh, experience and stuff like that. And we understood when I started reading all these uh, Self-help books, a lot of these things have been worked in the Western country for so many years and it's some sort of new to me. Uh, they, uh, uh, and it comes to lean management, I, I have a question to Dr. Manivan. Uh, if you talk in terms of lean management, I think this is a, it's come from the West to us, say. And West is predominantly, the rest of the world is predominantly public sector uh, hospitals. And they practice lean management there, but then here, uh, we are uh, corporate sector. We think of lean management in corporate sectors. Do our uh, is it possible to practice this lean management in our public sector hospitals so that youngsters will learn these principles from their earlier uh, uh, early in their career? A very true, sir. Say one is um, we are in private sector. At least uh, myself, you or Elango are in private sector. In fact, lean management is very important. Uh, uh, for private sector as well as public sector hospital actually. The government is investing so much of money in all these public sector hospitals, they can't afford to waste money actually. And uh, as I said, we fail to teach a lot of good things in medical college. Our, you know that our medical curriculum, Indian medical curriculum is uh, 30 years old actually. How can it be so uh, antique? It has become antique and redundant actually. We have to completely change it. We have to change the way our undergraduates are trained or postgraduates are trained actually. They have to be taught about all these principles. They have to be taught about how to use IT systems primarily. It's very difficult to make the doctor use the electronic medical records or any IT systems. So that has to be built in during their uh, formative years like UG or PG itself. And definitely uh, the uh, renowned teachers in the public uh, sector or hospital should definitely 
teach all these young surgeons about this. Or as Elango said during the start of this meeting, it is uh, today, uh, all these things are available on the net or in such kind of a forums. Even if this public uh, teaching institution doesn't teach, people like us can take effort to teach our fellows, uh, junior colleagues about all these best practices. And the uh, second important thing is, I think uh, uh, Indian uh, clinicians are more egoistic than any clinicians elsewhere in the world. And uh, you being uh, one of the, uh, um, you know, the um, MD of uh, a big brand, and I'm, I'm sure uh, you'll choose the best of consultants uh, in your organizations across the country. And uh, it's very difficult to change people. Actually, yesterday we were discussing uh, a few things um, in which we have learned that, especially antibiotic uh, protocols, it's, this changing practice, changing philosophy is very, very difficult uh, after a certain age. And you know, it's very difficult to make many, many senior surgeons to fall in line. How do you deal with that? Because corporate sector is full of people, varied uh, temperaments and varied uh, protocols and so on. It's not easy. So one thing I would like to contradict is Indian uh, clinicians are egoistic. No, anyone in the world or any human being who's accomplished will have an ego. <laughs> so uh, it's there across as a good accomplished person definitely has got an ego actually. So if you someone is a, a timid person, yes, humility is different, timid is different. And uh, say that is different actually. But not only surgeons, any good doctor has got their own ego. So we should respect that, actually. We should respect their clinical skills and contribution and get opinions and inputs from them. But when you are handling a senior surgeon or a accomplished surgeon or a busy surgeon in your hospital, if you're going to say that, say, look, doctor, uh, you send a circular saying that tomorrow onwards we are going to start the data at 7 o'clock. Anyone who is starting that incision time at 7.30 will uh, get up penalized or something like that. Okay. It's not going to work. As I said, it is a collaborative approach. You just tell the management problem to them and then tell that, say, look, this is what the problem is. It's not only management. Your fellow surgeons have got the same problem. You just tell them 75% of the time it gets corrected, actually. And say, rather than hurting the ego, we need not pamper the ego, but we support them in the right way. Okay. If you support them the right way, it is a bargain, win-win situation. I have supported this. Please support me. Use more words like please and thank you uh, for to all the doctors in the uh, hospital. Especially, I keep telling that, you know, I keep telling in my, I've given around six, seven lectures in uh, the All India Anesthesia Forums. Why anesthetists are the best people to manage a hospital? Can anyone say that? Why anesthetists are the best people to manage a hospital? Okay, this is not a related to lead, but I keep telling that. See, if you take Hello? surgeon. Yes. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, Anjali, yes. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, Patta, sir, and uh, Ilango Setu, sir. Excellent lecture, sir. Now, here, as our speaker is a chief anesthetist, I am happy to share that my hospital is managed by my husband, who is an anesthetist, sir. <laughs> I, am, I am working in a small, uh, our own nurse since last 20 years. Now, over the, as I was listening to your talk, over the last 20 years, I could realize the shift in myself. Uh, and the anesthetist has made me to think in the other perspective. Like uh, previously, we used to uh, suppose for the induction of the anesthesia, we are using propofol, uh, initially CO4 on isoflurane, previously endotracheal tubes, red endotracheal tube, later on disposable endotracheal tube, later on the LMA. So the cost of anesthesia, although it is going high and high, but the safety of the patient is going at a very uh, higher level, which is going to give you a number of patients. Instead of handling, uh, operating one patient, handling some of the XYZ complication, or suppose the hospitalization of the patient is going to increase. 
ultimately your income is going to decrease in such regard he has developed a system where he involves i am i am the person who decides which operation for this patient and what am i supposed to have whether what is the type of procedure and how much time required for the procedure rest of the things he will decide that you what is actually the nbm protocol what is actually the hospital stay what will be the actual his medical expenses in regards suppose for example uh, we have developed a system where suppose any perineal surgery i am a general and laparoscopic surgeon sir i have not after ms i have done lot of fellowships but not mgh uh, suppose for example after a, any perineal surgery we are giving the pudendal blocks so as to have the proper analgesia and the analgesic requirement goes low the cost of the methylin blue ampoule was 120 rupees we were requiring per patient only 2 cc rest of the 10 cc was going wastage so he had talked to many gynecologists who you, who used to have laparoscopy for the histo laparoscopy they uh, we had a discussion and in that we came to know that methylin blue can be autoclaved suppose okay. we, we we don't we don't two cc ampoule of the methylin blue so we have made special bulbs we have atoclave so that we can utilize the resources this is a very small example again very small example sir suppose in the abdominal wall reconstruction we are going we are using 30 by 30 mesh or more than that sometimes also. so the time required for the surgery how it can be reduced what step you have to do fast and what step you have to give time time he has clock he has a alarm clock in the ot now your time has finished and you are taking this time which is wasted so anesthesia gas anesthesia equipment he has taken the abg monitor so uh, anesthesia gas monitor so these uh, he used to say that whatever best anesthesia i give i am not going to have the extra charges but if you finish the procedure quickly you will get extra charges from the patient so take your take your charges from the patient and ask that patient to send another patient so uh, these are small examples sir and i agree totally with you sir that anesthetists are the neutral observers that they can realize what is your uh, basically where are you lagging behind and which is your good point now uh, as you said atul gawande has posted a checklist now atul gawande sir i have met several time because he belongs to the umar khed proper which is very near to which is very near from my place and my father in law was principal in that college where the college was developed by the father of atul gawande so we several once in a year dr atul gawande is coming to that primary institute and he has a meeting of several surgeons that what is the scenario in india so from atul gawande uh, we have realized that the healthcare system in the us or the western uh, western uh, world he, there the western world have one two three choices but here we have to explain to the patient sir that what is the best suitable procedure for you what is the cost for that what are the possible problems after this procedure and if that problem occurs is he ready to go to a higher center if i am working in a small so these are some of the challenges sir and i think even though medical college teaches you but it is a self learning experience sir it's very uh, uh, excellent doctor anjali so basically yeah uh, uh see this is what then if you respect the every professional or every team member in your uh, uh, theater or a hospital they, i mean they everyone will add lot of value so one thing is why anesthetists are best people to manage hospital the best surgeon you see the the most egoistic surgeon will be the best uh, surgeon the best anesthetist the very very less egoistic person will become the best anesthetist actually that's what we keep telling actually so when you are in management you have to be less egoistic so even if a junior most surgeon uh, shouts at you probably you listen okay doctor but okay we'll look at next time okay so you have to keep thinking and understand that okay this surgeon adds value okay fine he was angry i accepted so you have to be less egoistic then you become a great administrator you or more egoistic you become an excellent surgeon but yeah i mean we have to see a great administrator and a great surgeon together in a person uh, i would like to analyze them <laughs> thank you sir 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, fine interaction. If there are uh, no further questions, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, time that you have taken to spend with us, Dr. Mani. I know you have a very busy schedule. Uh, we enjoyed listening to your talk, and I'm sure when it is uploaded on YouTube, uh, there will be much more interest shown in this, and a lot of youngsters will benefit, and it will be a recurrent learning for you and surgeons like me. Thank you very much. Pata, sir, your, for your closing commands. It was a wonderful session, and I think uh, it should be one of the many sessions that are going to come in the future because I think, uh, as you kept saying, that this is an introductory sort of lecture. So, we would like to have you in our forum uh, uh, a lot more times uh, in the future. And uh, thank you again for spending time with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.